Okay, now we're back and we're gonna we're continuing to talk about this. Hopefully that makes sense. Elastic, inelastic, right? The top half, the bottom half. Here we have unitary. Here's perfect, uh, perfect elasticity and perfect inelasticity. And hopefully I was we were running out of time, so I was going a little bit uh, zooming through here. We have our x and our y. Remember, I'm gonna do this in uh, let's do black. We have our y and our x. And remember, we know what happens if y is greater than x or if x is greater than y. Um, and also, what happens if x is equal to y. Right. So this is a good way for us to determine whether or not we're elastic or inelastic. And what this really brings us to, because now we've covered two parts, two important parts of the demand curve. We look at, in any demand curve, we know where we want to be, generally. Or, well, we'll get to that. This is the part that academics would disagree with me on. And this is what I've said again and again. The biggest difference between what we do, what we talk about with our stuff, and what the academic approach would tell you is that our goal is to monetize this, is to you know to to use this material to actually make money. So, from Jack's point of view, and we've been talking so much about Jack, but we haven't seen him in a while. Where is he? There he is. Okay, there he is, Jack. Okay, Jack. And remember, he was a little unhappy here, and. Um, that's because if he raises his price, he actually loses money. So he has strong elasticity in this example. But in order for Jack, where Jack wants to be, in order for him to have inelasticity is in this bottom part of the demand curve. So already we're, we're understanding two different parts of our, um, this is our acronym, all. We're understanding the first two parts here, the angular and the linear. We understand the angle, we're going to cover this more, and then when we understand the linear part, we want to be in the bottom half of that line. Now, let's move on and talk about the demand curve in general and some other interesting things about this and really how to start moving the demand curve. So I'll do the standard demand curve in blue. Okay, here's our demand curve. And as we've already learned, it actually extends out, but we're just looking at this segment right here. This is all we're looking at right now. Within our demand curve, we have, here we have our price, right? This should all be uh, getting really really familiar to you price and quantity here's our origin our zero point here at the bottom so here's our origin price quantity and we know that if we pick any line because basically when we have movement on the demand curve there's two di two main things to consider this is if we pick a point here and a point here this does not represent this is a movement down on the demand curve, or if we started here, we could call this a movement up. So depending on where we stand, it's either a movement up or down along the curve. But this is a change in the quantity demanded. This is not a change in demand. So this is a very important concept, and that is that the um, change in price, which is all this represents here, right? This does ch represent a difference in the actual quantity demanded, but we also have a difference in the price here. A change in price is not equal to a change in demand. It is a change in the quantity demanded. But we are moving along the same curve. We're not actually moving the curve. In order for us to move the curve, we have to go one of two ways, which is basically right or left. All right. Now, as we know, Right is more and left is less. But instead of just believing that or just uh, us not examining that, let's really look at, um, let's illustrate that on this curve. Let's say we move to the left here and then we'll move to the right. We'll have this in green. So here we have two changes on our graph here. This is a movement to the right and this is a movement to the left. Let's look at what happens at a price. We'll pick a price of uh, 10. Let's say we're going to start here. This is going to be a price of $10. Okay? Let's plot this out first here. We'll start with our kind of purple line. All right, we. Well, that might not be purple. I don't know. I'm not sure what color that is. Uh, let's pick that one. All right. Uh, okay, this is the kind of purple line. Okay. We come out here, we hit this number, and then we come down, and we have a corresponding quantity, right? We're going to call this Q1. Now let's go back to our first demand line right here at $10. We're going to start back at $10, right? We're going to come out. We're going to hit our demand curve right here along the plot that we already had. We're going to come down and we're going to have a corresponding quantity. Okay? And now 
we'll start with our green. Hopefully you're you're moving ahead and you know where we're going with this. We come out here, we hit our demand curve here, and we come down and we have Q3. Okay? Now since we are actually using three different demand curves, we need to number them somewhat appropriately. So this will be uh this will be D1, D2, even though I drew this one first, it's D2, and then this one over here is D3. Man, what is going on with my threes? What was that? Okay, that's a little bit better. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have D1, D2, and D3. And then we have the same price. So we come over here at $10. And let's just shade each of these uh, areas in. First, we'll start with this kind of purple area right here. This represents 10 times Q1, right? So this was 10 times Q1. It doesn't really matter what Q1 is, by the way. Hopefully you, you know that by now. It's not really going to make a big difference. Then for our blue, that's kind of blue. Our kind of blue line, there's so many colors here. This is going to be 10 times Q2, right? And then for our green line, our last line, we have this here. This is 10 times Q3. Okay, from Jack's point of view, from the supplier, from the provider's point of view, what do we want to have here? Which one is the best? Which, what is going to be the best result for us? Hopefully, we don't need to do any math for this, right? Well, well, well you're doing kind of internal math. That's going to be really obvious just by looking at this, right? Because 10 times Q1 is going to equal some value, right? Let's call this value X. We'll call this value, let me do this in a different color. We'll call this value X, this value Y, and this value Z. Now, what do we know about these values? We know that X is going to be less than Y, and Y is going to be less than Z, right? Because we know that the quantity here, because as we move right along our Q, what always happens, right? We are increasing the quantity. Just like when we move up along the Y axis, we're increasing price right when we move when we move right along our um, x-axis we are actually increasing every time so we know that q1 is greater or we know that q2 is greater than q1 and we know that q3 is greater than q2 so we know that syllogism we know that q3 is greater than q1 right anytime we have two points on a line the one that's further to the right is or that's above it is going to be more than the, the previous one so as long as these are as long as we have we know that the q1 q2 and q3 we know the relationship they have to each other any number multiplied by them as long as it's the same number and as long as it's a positive number um, that is always going to be a greater number than the previous right, right? so q1 and q2 any number multiplied by by each other as long as q2 is more as long as that number is positive it's going to be a greater number so X is greater than Y and Y is greater than Z. So this is a fancy way basically in a fundamental way so we understand it from the ground up of understanding that as long as we move to the right, as long as we're moving our demand curve to the right, right here, let me represent this. As long as we're moving to the right, that is the, the change, generally speaking, that we're going to want to see with any demand curve that we have. So Jack is going to want to move that demand curve along the right because, and we can, instead of using 10, we can plot 20 different prices, up or down, it really doesn't matter. Because at every corresponding price, when we go out here, one, two, three, we're always going to see greater profits for Jack on this demand curve that's moved over here, right? Because price times quantity, because all we're doing is 10 times Q1, we're taking the price times the quantity. So this is this representation basically shows us that when we, we want to move our demand curve to the right and what happens with that uh, that movement in demand curve. Now we're going to talk about what is the difference between or we we understand now the difference between a, a movement along the curve right here that's represented right here right this is a movement along the curve and an actual shift in the cu the curve. It makes a fundamental difference in every function. But the real question is what makes these differences? How do we uh, what changes the what would what would happen for a movement to be along the curve versus a shift or a movement of the actual curve right or left? Okay, there's a few different variables, and actually, man, we're running out. Time goes by so quick. Okay, we're gonna run out of time. We're gonna pick up right here where we left off next time and talk about the movements of demand and actually how we can uh, make those movements. How Jack can make those movements. Okay, so we're gonna pick up right here next time. Okay, hope that helps. Talk soon.